Hello. Hi. Hi, Janet. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's work. Everyone, the sound is great. Yeah. You can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I think once uh, there was a uh, short disruption in your voice, but otherwise everything looks good. Good. Yeah, I was just changing to my headphones. So now it should be good, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> so nice to meet you, first of all. Thank you. Thank you for accepting our invite uh, in this very unusual time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everybody is really, yeah. uh, the whole routine is disturbed. Uh, but still, you you accepted our invite. We are really uh, glad. Sorry about that. No problem at all. My headphones fell off. I have to pick them up. Just no to say for the next ten minutes, I yeah. maybe with me. Uh, one one week old. Yeah, <laughs> my wife. Here. Congratulations. As you see, that's how we are doing these days. With yeah, them. so that so it makes us even more grateful. We are more grateful that you know even uh, this is really a time you must be with uh, your wife with the baby. Uh, yeah, you must be having yeah. long nights. Yeah, and we have a boy also who is yet to be two years old. I just took him uh -huh. to the nursery. <laughs> and yeah, so it's it's a bit of a tricky times, I bet, everywhere right now. Yeah, yeah. It's difficult to decide what is safe, what is not. But we have to all make our decisions, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'll just pick up my headphones if you do. Yeah, please. <laughs> Feel free. So perhaps before I set all this up, let's just check if my presentation is working well, shall yeah. I? Shall I share my screen? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. So, um, just a moment. Here we go. Can you see my screen? Yeah. We can see it. Okay, now I'm starting the presentation, so you should see the whole screen. Yeah, and we can see. Still working. Okay. Yeah. So I'm moving things around, so everything is working well. Yeah. Okay. And we're starting at ten o'clock. The presentation. Yeah, in ten minutes. <laughs> So you, you guys are in again a lockdown. I think it's the third lockdown in UK. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Now it's again a very strict lockdown. Um, but for example, for our nursery, only key workers can have people in the nursery. And just yesterday, I managed to arrange with my university to give me key worker status. So it's, it depends on your employee to decide whether you are key workers. Mainly it's people who have you know, the duties to keep the essential things running. Mm -hmm. So it's only a few people are in the nursery at the moment, for example, but most things are closed. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. So it's really an alarming situation looks like. Yeah, this new virus, this variant is spreading very, very quickly. Uh, it seems that perhaps it takes a longer time for it to have symptoms. So people don't notice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, we have the vaccination, but it's happening too slowly, right? It's, yeah. It's, Did you get it? I haven't. No, we, we didn't get it yet. But a lot of people around me are getting it. I mean, uh -huh. people that I hear from, you know, the, the 
social networks, some people in my family or so forth. Yeah. So how is it going in? So, so it's easily available there. So people just go to hospital or and, the and get vaccinated. Vaccine. Yeah, vaccination. Vaccination is happening by the age. So at the moment, just people over 80 years old. Half mm -hmm. of the people over 80 have been vaccinated so far. I think they're just vaccinating based on how vulnerable people are. And then they will continue with medical workers and so forth. So yeah, it's very systematic. You can't just go there and ask for vaccination. Okay, okay, okay. It will take months before someone like me can be vaccinated. It's a, uh, it's hard to imagine, you know, in, uh, 20 years ago when I was in Europe and now when I look back, I try to look back, uh, I can't imagine, you know, how life would have been there. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, here in Pakistan, we are more careless, you know, people are, they don't follow really SOPs. In, in academic <laughs> institutes, we do have strict control. But when you go in, in supermarkets, malls, you you wonder if there's anything wrong in the world going on. So it's business <laughs> as usual. But yeah. imagining, yeah. you know, um, the kind of situation you are going through in UK and in Europe in particular. What, uh, is, what are temperatures? What are the temperatures like at the moment? Nowadays we have uh, night temperature is like seven, eight degrees Celsius. And uh, day temperature is like 13 and 15. In last two days, it, it started getting a bit warmer. So it is a bit wintry also in your case. Yeah, okay. Not yeah, it is cold, winter. But in principle, cold enough because when it's warm, the virus doesn't do very well. I think that the, the worst thing is when it can last on the surfaces a bit longer or so forth and that it needs certain cold. That's why now when it's cold, it's become worse. But um, Perhaps also people are more immune generally in Pakistan, more used to viruses and so forth. <laughs> looks like <laughs> it looks like we have some genetic variation accumulated over uh, maybe yeah. decades. But hopefully you also get vaccinated. I mean, we probably it's worldwide now happening, so it will be soon over, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, we hope to, uh, but I think it depends because uh, our government is uh, trying to uh, buy vaccine from uh, three different sources and definitely it depends on the availability, how many doses they can uh, get. Uh, people who develop vaccine, they have their first right. And then of course the ones, uh, who can easily afford it. I think countries like Pakistan or third world countries, they will uh, have to wait a bit. But unless we don't have vaccination all over the world, this is not going to be controlled. Mm, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very important that, I think that this very first round of expensive vaccines, these RNA based ones, they were probably quite limited but now that we're having the standardized vaccines like AstraZeneca coming, I think they're coming in much larger amounts so mm. it should be hopefully more global now yeah India also has started producing uh, I was reading they they teamed up with AstraZeneca and they have started they will produce in India the vaccine which is being produced by AstraZeneca Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think if, if we have different uh, production units spread all around the world, I, I think that's the way to go. Sure. 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 Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, Yarme. Hi, Dr. Farid. Hi, Muhammad. So it's actually Dr. Afzal who, who told us to get connected with uh, uh, you and, you know, yeah. It was Afsal's recommendation. Thanks. Oh, Yarne, I, I'm a good friend of Julian. Julian is my, my yeah. colleague. He told me, yes. Yes, Julian is a postdoc in my lab, and he's yeah. the one yeah. who connected us. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much for coming, and we are really very excited to have you and listen to you. Yeah, I see it's a wonderful series, and it's great that you are having it available. 
also global. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, Dr. Tarek is effort and it is really going very successful. Yeah, yeah, very nice people so far I've seen already. Uh, we are going to have, uh, I think in January we have uh, three more people maybe. Abdullah, correct me, uh, three. So we have uh, uh, Helge Grosser from FMI. Mm -hmm. you, you must know him, he's also working in RNA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, Giacomo Cavalli from, uh, he's a chromatin guy. And we have also uh, Tony Hunter. Uh, Tony Hunter, Anna, Abdullah, am I right? Yes. Yeah, the cell signaling guru. So I think for us, it's a big blessing in disguise, uh, Janice, because uh, for us, it's financially and even the logistically not possible to have high class uh, highly accomplished people such as yourself and others in pakistan uh, it's a small department we started around um, 12 years ago in 2008 with a vision that we are going to have an interdisciplinary uh, engineering and sciences school where future science and engineering student they should be educated in a no boundaries philosophy. For example, our biology majors, our bio majors, they learn uh, three hardcore math courses which engineers have to take like uh, differential equations, probability and statistics, uh, calculus two, then uh, three uh, hardcore physics courses like modern physics, mechanics, uh, electricity and magnetism. So it was a very unusual experiment we started 12 years ago um, and it, it it turned out to be very successful because our uh, BS students after BS uh, in biology or chemistry from Pakistan, from our school they uh, get fully funded PhD abroad and uh, I think in biology alone we have like 78 to uh, more than 80 students I would say who are now doing fully funded PhDs in US uh, in top tier places like we had students going to Harvard. And um, this year we had a student who got offer from Harvard, Cornell, Rockefeller, and I don't know, number of places. And he opted for Harvard. Uh, so our BS program really uh, is very unusual. Mm -hmm. But what we always missed was, uh, you know, because I always felt like we are isolated in Pakistan. We are just 10, eight to 10 professors in biology, eight to 10 in chemistry. And we don't have access to high quality conferences. And, you know, you know, the seminar culture, the mm -hmm. whole science runs on seminar culture. Yeah. Uh, and COVID turned out to be a blessing for us. Yeah. <laughs> I quickly thought everybody now knows Zoom. Everybody is used to yeah. Zoom. And, you mm -hmm. know, let's try if they accept it. And I'm very lucky. Uh, before I'm also you... very happy because I don't, first of all, I don't like flying for just the reasons of all the, you know, all you have to go through on yeah. the way, changing the time zones, but also for ecological reasons. And I personally decided I'm not going to take flights out of Europe and even within Europe as much as possible not to take. Uh, I think times are changing. Also scientists, we are realizing it's a very urgent situation to change our lifestyles so yeah <laughs> it was a way to also help us to get used to it yeah hmm. and i think yarne is a very good example i, I if i believe i'm correct uh, he is, he was a mathematician for from his training but then he became a biologist of high class uh -huh. that's kind of to say not so deep end mathematician i more at, up to the high school level, I was more into mathematics. But once I went to college, I moved towards biology, molecular biology, and so forth. But yeah, I always like to work with people who are very, you know, interested in mathematics and modeling and so forth, who are much better than me nowadays. So, but as we we know that you have started this, you know, very quantitative. Uh, sequencing analysis and this came from your work and we are really lucky to have you listen yeah. today to be honest my brother is mathematician so he studied mathematics and he works in mathematics 
And the first paper I published on Clip, he's the second author. So oh. he did all the computation and modeling behind. We didn't even publish all of that. But <clears throat> from the very beginning, when I started my PhD, he's a bit older than me. He mm -hmm. was doing a lot of modeling with me. And then once he was you know, too busy with his own stuff, I always found someone else to take over from what he's, we started together. So a lot of that is also a little bit of, you know, just having someone else to help you out. Is yeah, great. yeah, yeah, this is great. It's so I, think of we, I think I will just move into the other room where it's quiet. So I'll be no problem. So I think we can start. It's, uh, uh, it's time now. And uh, let me first introduce you and uh, then I'll hand over. Abdullah, uh, everybody is there? Okay. So let me introduce uh, Jarnesh. So it's a real player. We have uh, uh, Professor Dr. Jarnesh Uli, uh, who has obtained his PhD from Rockefeller University in uh, New York in 2004, um, where he co-developed a technique called CLIP to study protein and RNA interactions in cells. Um, in 2006, uh, he started his independent research program uh, to study RNA regulation in brain, uh, which led to development of iClip and HiClip. Uh, and I'm sure we are going to learn about them, which are high resolution methods uh, to comprehensively map protein RNA and RNA RNA networks. His research team is located uh, at the Francis Crick Institute uh, in UK. Uh, and Jarnaj also holds a professorship at uh, UCL Institute of Neurology in uh, UK. In 2020, he has also initiated a small satellite lab in Lithuania. Uh, is it Lithuania? You are mute, uh, Jarnaj. Slovenia. Sorry, so, yeah, Slovenia. So, small European country, yes. Yeah, in, in Slovenia, sorry. So his team is, uh, so Jern is, is uh, investigating how protein RNA complexes, they contribute to development and evolution. Uh, and when something goes wrong, when they are faulty, how they contribute to conditions affecting the nervous system, uh, such as uh, myotrophic lateral sclerosis. Today, Jarnesh is going to talk about RNA biology at the crossroads of evolution and disease. Uh, it's a pleasure. Over to you, Jarnesh. So, uh, first of all, nice to meet you all and thanks for taking your time. I will take you through two stories, one that is unpublished, one that has been published a couple of years ago, but I think it's interesting to put them into connection and to some bigger perspective. And actually, this gives me the opportunity perhaps to think about it in a new way because there's something that connects me to Pakistan. Since I was a teenager, I loved Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan and Kavali, for example. This is one of my favorites. I was very sad when he passed away. And also Indian classical music or you know, general Pakistani classical music, Sarod and this type of music. This is what I listened to. I can tell you whole story why, but um, that's something very close to my heart. And I think that thinking about science from that perspective of also that kind of um, place in the world that you have some other connection also gives you another way of maybe stepping away from it. And I try to do that a little bit in this talk here. So I will just go through a very basic and forgive me because probably a lot of it will be a little bit too simplistic for all of you, but just so that we um, uh, are all on the same background. So um, we are looking at nucleic acids and um, they're kind of the most well-known nucleic acid is DNA where the genetic information is stored and passed across cells and generations. And here we can imagine each of these little circles being a nucleotide. So genetic information is stored in 
the sequence of four different nucleotides, which we can just look at it like this. And when it kind of gets converted into something that has action in the cells, the first step is to make RNA from DNA. And RNA is a single-stranded molecule, unlike DNA that forms a double helix. Um, and especially once it's transcribed, it's transcribed as a single strand. But of course, um, actually RNA can form very complex structures. It can pair up with itself or with different RNA molecules. So it can form double-stranded helices, but those form in shorter strands of RNA. But the important bit is that the sequence of the RNA, when it's transcribed, is identical to the DNA. Can you see my mouse when I'm showing here? You can, right? Um, so basically the information yes, is retained and RNA is carrying that information onwards in the cells. Um, and that information is, um, that cop um, transcription from DNA to RNA is made by RNA polymerase. We have various types of RNA polymerase, but I'm not gonna go into that. Um, and as soon as the RNA is being made by the polymerase, proteins start binding to the RNA. And we call these proteins as RNA binding proteins. So the rest of this talk will be all about RNA binding proteins. And it's important to be aware that RNA is not available in an unbound form to the cells um, because RNA is a relatively labile molecule. If it is not covered by protein, it will be quickly recognized by nucleases that can start chopping it up and digesting it. It's not as stable as DNA, partly because it's in the single-stranded form. So the RNA binding proteins, the first role they have when they bind to RNAs is just protect it to make it more stable. But they do lots of other things too. So then when we imagine what a gene is, so it's like a portion of the DNA molecule, in most cases, the RNA transcripts that are made are roughly equivalent to the length of the gene. Um, and that immediate RNA transcript that is made is called a pre-mRNA. So that is when we're talking about protein coding genes. There's a lot of other genes in the genome that will just make the RNA and the RNA is the functional unit of that gene. But here I'm giving an example of one that then is further making protein. But most protein coding genes are made into what is called a pre-mRNA, where only pieces of those RNAs will actually be used to make proteins. And those pieces are called exons. And the pieces that are removed are called introns. To make things a little bit more complicated, many exons are alternative. So those are color coded here. So we have blue and red, and you can make different mRNA isoforms from that. So from the same gene, for example, in this case, we make two different isoforms and they will contain different variants of these alternative exons. And that process of splicing together pieces of pre-mRNAs is called splicing, is the word that I used, and is defined by sequences on the RNA, specifically the splice site sequences. We call them five prime, three prime splice sites. They are recognized by a complex machinery called spliceosome. The very first component of that is U1 SNRP that binds to the five prime splice sites. It's a very highly structured um, complex, and it's what we call the ribonucleoprotein complex. It is made of an RNA molecule. This is a non-coding RNA, which you can see here with a bunch of little helices sticking out and, uh, and many different proteins that are wrapped around this RNA. And it's interesting that an RMP molecule regulates another RNA. And it actually works in such a way that parts of this um, RNA, which is called U1 SNRNA, is actually complementary to the regions on the five prime splice site. So that's how it actually defines where the borders of axons are. Um, and we have lots of these RMPs in the cell. I will use this term a lot, RNP, so remember that. So it's whenever we have a protein complex assembling on an RNA. Um, and many of these RMPs are composed on non-coding RNAs that have very defined structures. Um, but I'm also interested in RMPs that are composed on these types of RNAs like pre-mRNAs, which are very long and change as they go through the cell and these are more regulated RMPs. Um, and actually the first thing that is happening here is proteins that regulate this choice about which of these alternative axons actually gets chosen. Um, and these are the examples of this protein. So here we have a blue protein that will bind 
to the same position where normally the U1 SNRP is supposed to bind, and it blocks that binding side. By blocking this side, this will repress the inclusion of the blue axon and promote the red axon. We have other proteins that may bind in positions that actually help the U1 SNRP to assemble, to kind of recruit and stabilize them, them. So that just depends on where exactly these proteins bind, what types of proteins they are, and these red proteins will be enhancing that exon here. And we have these sequences in the RNA that we then call splicing silencers or enhancer sequences that can interact with these regulatory proteins. And whenever these, re these are proteins that are more um, dynamic, they are not always bound to this target RNA. They can bind in many different positions and many different transcripts. And I would call these more regulatory interactions, regulatory RNPs. And that's the kind of question that my group is trying to, to answer, how these regulatory RNPs work in the cells in the context of development, disease, and evolution. The methods that we use are generally based on more high throughput sequencing systems approaches. We've been contributing to developments um, where we use UV light to cross-link protein RNA contacts. Um, UV light has the quality that it will form a covalent bond between zero angstrom contacts between proteins and RNA. So you really have to have a highly selective interaction and direct interaction between protein RNA for this biophysical switch to happen that you actually create a covalent bond. So the electrons have to jump between the two. Um, and so once this covalent bond happens, you can use very stringent purification methods because the bond is very stable. Uh, actually, it's impossible to reverse it during our procedure. The only way we can release the RNA is to digest the protein eventually. And I will talk you through this method a little bit later. We use bioinformatics. When I say we, this is mainly people I work with. I'm not very good in bioinformatics myself, but I like to, to work with people who know more than I do and um, generally look at sequence and structural motifs on the RNA to find features that are in common with certain regulatory patterns. Um, we we'll use sequencing to uh, study regulation of RNA, such as alternative splicing, polydenylation, I will talk about it. And when we put all these data together, we can get insights into some general principles, such as position dependent principles, grouping of motifs close to each other for some combinatorics, and of course, the way how biology works, how these proteins assemble and travel along with the RNA. Neurons are very interested, interesting when it comes to RNA because RNA travels out of the nucleus to the cytoplasm to make proteins, that's well known. But in heavily polarized cells, especially neurons, RNA will travel very, very far from the cell body into the neuronal processes. And especially when it comes to memory, for example, synaptic plasticity, RNA is available for translation at the synapse where these synaptic plasticity changes are happening. So um, it actually allows very local regulation of gene expression in very fast kind of responsiveness in response to local activity changes and signaling, um, which is much faster than you could do when you had to go through the nucleus, transcribe new RNA and so forth. You just locally quickly make new protein. RNA is already available for that. And that's something that people believe is very close to the way life worked originally when it started. At the origin of life, possibly we only had RMP biology. The DNA may have come in later on into life. So the way neurons work, the way our memory works is somehow reflective to the way that life started, perhaps. And that's what also makes me interested in this field. Now, um, one aspect that is going to be important for this talk is that RNA binding proteins tend to be composed of two types of modules. One module will be the heavily structured domains, which are here on this image represented by these squares or circles. So these are most commonly RRM or KH family domains. Um, many RNA binding proteins will have multiple repeats of that, such domains, maybe two repeats. In some cases, you'll have four repeats. For example, this protein PTB has four repeats of the RRM domains. But then they have this, what we just draw here as little loops or little you know, extra 
lines on the protein. And this is what we call intrinsically disordered regions. And I will call, call them IDR. So those are regions of proteins that if you just purify them on their own and have them in solution, they will not have defined structure, especially if the protein is present in a relatively low concentration. They might form some dynamic structures, but by NMR, you will not be able to see something definitive. And they won't crystallize, they won't form something that you would really be able to um, define as a very stable thing. Um, but they can form when they're in complex with proteins or when they form certain critical concentration, they can start forming some very definitive interactions or structures. And recent years have been really interesting in this respect in understanding how these regions contribute to biology. So I will talk about these regions a bit more now. And the, the other thing to take away from this image is that um, when it comes to splicing, we will have lots of interactions between complexes that promote recognition of axons. So here we have this U1 SNRP that I mentioned before. We have the U2 that recognizes the branch point, a bunch of other proteins that define certain regions around axons. All of those proteins interact within each other. So they act as a group to define an axon and help with specificity of splicing. And when it comes to regions within the introns, which are actually removed and degraded, we also have lots of interactions between proteins that bind within the introns that also help to say, this is an intron, you shouldn't include that into an mRNA. And they also interact with each other and form their own complexes. So there, are, you actually have to think about this regulation as competing complexes rather than individual proteins acting on their own. And we'll talk about it more later. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the relevance of all this for disease. And one disease where RNA biology has emerged as very, very central is ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, it's an incurable disease. Um, I would say not the co most common neurodegenerative disease, but um, it's very deadly. So once you get symptoms, on average, people will pass away within three years. Um, and uh, it's a very difficult disease because you're fully conscious. It, it kills your motor neurons in the spinal cord and in the motor cortex, but the rest of your brain is perfectly fine. So you can actually um, be aware of the whole process. Um, and simply in the end, you can't breathe anymore. So your breathing gives away, but slowly your movements give away, um, uh, stop working. And basically you are seeing your body passing away while you're consciously there which is almost like the opposite picture from something like dementia and Alzheimer's, where your body is fine, but the cortex is failing and kind of the person is disappearing and their body is still working. Um, it's hard to know which one is worse, but definitely these diseases are hard for the person who is going through them and hard for everyone who is watching that. And it would be good to find ways to understand them. We don't even fully understand them yet. What else have effective treatments. Um, so RNA biology emerged in the recent years as a new opportunity to understand ALS, but actually also all neurodegeneration. Through understanding ALS, we realize how much of this phenomena is actually underlying all of the neurodegeneration. Um, now, the mutations that have identified in these proteins all emerged in the last 15 years. The very first mutation that was identified was in TDP43, I believe that was maybe published in 2006. And most of these other mutations were identified in the last 10 years or so. Um, and still you can see these are, by red dots are the positions where mutations in these proteins can cause the disease. So they are generally um, Mendelian um, mutations that are quite, you know, you can trace them through linkage in families, um, but they can also emerge in, um, in somatic cells and not be that inherited. Uh, but you can see most of those mutations are concentrated in these regions of the proteins that um, I name as IDR. And that, that is what really made the whole field start to think about these regions a bit more. They have been relatively ignored previously because they are so hard to understand through structural biology. 
and structural biology being very dominant in molecular biology, it was thought whatever is not structured is probably not that important perhaps. But given this importance in disease, suddenly um, a lot of different techniques have been directed towards them. And I think we are starting to gain really interesting insights. I mean, not so much. I think a lot of other labs are revealing aspects that you know are very, very interesting. And I can't really be the expert to talk about it. I'm sure you're gonna hear more from others. But the protein I will talk about more here is TDP43 because that is the original one that has most mutations identified and actually is also implicated in the broadest range of diseases. In ALS, it has the greatest proportion of patients with mutations, but also what is interesting with this protein is that when you look at postmortem tissue from patients, most of them will have large inclusions of these proteins that almost take over the whole cell sometimes, mostly in the cytoplasm. The protein is normally nuclear, but in patients, you see these huge inclusions, aggregates of these proteins in the cytoplasm. That was originally observed in ALS, but more and more also now in other types of neurodegenerative diseases, even in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, it is often observed, not as often, but these diseases listed here have it really commonly. Um, and the first approach we took here was to take patient tissue from um, healthy human brain versus brain that has these inclusions of TDP43. And we can actually perform this cross-linking based method from human tissue because you can take frozen tissue and cross-link the powder. So you can just convert the tissue into powder, put it to UV light for about 30 seconds, that forms the covalent bond, and you will still be able to follow up interactions that are happening within the cells because you're not lysing the cells when you do cross-linking. So when we compared the interactions of this protein between normal brain and diseased brain, we saw some RNAs being quite different. And this particular RNA had the greatest change in terms of the proportion of binding it had in disease tissue had a much greater proportion than the healthy brain tissue. And you can see that quantified here. And we also noticed that this proportion differs along between cell types. So certain cell types like ES cells, embryonic stem cells have very little binding whereas these neuroblastoma cells have a lot of binding and there's also change between health and disease. So we thought, okay, there's perhaps some phenomenon going on in disease that is also happening through development. And if understanding development, we might be also understanding disease a bit more. Um, one thing to just highlight is that this RNA is very long. It's a non-coding RNA, um, 20 kilobases long. It might be the most, the longest non-coding RNA and the most abundant one in the cell. Um, and it contains these regions that uh, have sequences repeating of two nucleotides. Uh, on the RNA, this would read as UG, 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 UG. And that's what this protein is also known to bind, TDP43. So it's certainly the high binding of this RNA makes sense in terms of the sequence it has. And then we followed up with a study in development, and indeed we found that TDP43 regulates this RNA. So this is a non-coding RNA that can be made into two variants. The long variant is 20 KB, and the short variant is only about 8 KB. And this short variant has a poly A tail. The long variant has some kind of a triple helix at the end that is also very common in viral RNAs. Um, and TDP43 regulates the production of this long variant because it promotes polydenylation here of the short variant. Um, so actually we realized that in ES cells, TDP43 activity is extremely high, is when TDP43 is the most active and most abundant. And in ES, so these embryonic stem cells, both mouse and human, we can detect the short variant with imaging, but not very much of the long variant. Um, but when we take TDP43 away, we can start seeing the long variant in ES cells. So um, through a bunch of other studies, also by changing this poly A side, we found that TDP43 promotes polydenylation here to promote the short variant, and in some way it inhibits production of this long variant. But on the other hand, the long variant also binds to TDP43. We've seen it in disease, it binds it much more. And we, through our study, we found that there is a kind of a feedback going on. TDP43 prevents the production of long variant, but the long variant creates something called paraspeckles, which is a large nuclear 
um, kind of what you call membraneless compartment um, that attracts a lot of protein into it, including TDP43. We also saw that when these paraspeckles form, that TDP43 somewhat um, pushed away from mRNAs. So it has a, an effect on TDP43 itself. So they affect each other. There's some kind of a feedback going on. So whenever we have a feedback loop, we have to start thinking about disease because the disease is often a way for a feedback loop to get shifted in some way that the process leading to disease gets initiated when the feedback loop is disrupted. So we're interested in these feedback loops. Um, so now this was a bit of past work. Now I wanted to actually tell you something that some published, the new work on TDP43 still. Um, and that's very collaborative. And I like to highlight how nicely these people have worked together. Martina has led this work. She's a very experienced postdoc who has focused on all the CLEAP and transcriptomics and cell biology work. Flora uh, was a PhD student in the lab and now staying as a postdoc for a bit, who is a very big expert on imaging. And so she did lots of those work in the cells. Nobby is a joint PhD student with the bioinformatics lab, Niklas Kom, who did most of the bioinformatics. And Bo Lim Lee is a technician with Jim Shorter in Philadelphia, who did studies of phase separation, which you probably have heard about. It's a very big topic lately that these disordered regions are capable of condensing. And this is a process that often involves phase separation. So uh, this region, disordered region that I mentioned earlier is actually not uniform. Uh, it contains sub portions that are quite different to each other. And actually the best way to define it is to say that there are two really highly disordered regions. So if we look at the disordered prediction, we can say these two regions are highly disordered and don't have any capacity to form any defined structures. But in the middle of that, it's a more highly conserved region that does have a potential for a structure. It's not huge potential. It will not form that structure in, under any condition. Um, but it, as I'll show you later, that structure can form under conditions of crowding. You can also see that certain amino acids are dominating in, in certain regions. So this region tends to be glycine rich. Uh, the conserved region has lots of alanines that promote helix formation. And there's regions that are kind of prion-like. Um, and at the end, we have lots of serins and so forth. Um, so we wanted to understand, you know, given that there's lots of diversity here, is what, what these different portions of these relative disordered regions are doing. And that's where we worked with Jim Shorter, made deletions of different portions, and then actually looked at how this protein behaves when it's purified, when a full length protein is purified. And you can see it forms these droplets in vitro. And that's the process of phase separation. The protein on its own tends to condense and they're kind of dynamic situations. So these droplets are not just fibrils, proteins coming in and out, um, but it has that propensity. And that propensity is disrupted by most of the deletions, except the very last deletion here, this one here. That one is still perf gen generally fine. So in the end, all of the deletions are perturbing at least part of the conserved region. So we, in the end, decided to focus most of our attention on this region here. And when we put the same variants into cells, made cell lines expressing inducibly these proteins, we saw exactly the same behavior as when we had purified protein. So again, this last deletion didn't have much impact on the formation of these foci in the cells. These are, these are all cell nuclei, but most of the other ones perturb the foci. And you can see just the counts of the foci here. And we can also see that the mobility of the protein is kind of um, opposite to the formation of foci. So if you have foci, that means the mobility of the protein is relatively slow. If you don't, it means the protein is moving in the cells much faster. Um, and so this is measured by FRAP. In the way we conclude that it probably just the behavior of the protein on its own, the way it is on its own in vitro, also reflects what's happening in the cells. It's mainly protein binding to itself, homomultimerizing that drives this behavior. Um, and you can explain that also through biophysical studies. So these are studies from Nick Fawzi's lab who has done lots of NMR and showed that this conserved region has a potential to form an alpha helix, but that only form, forms when the protein is crowded. If you have it relatively low concentration in diffuse 
situation, it doesn't form this helix very much. Um, but when it's crowded, this helix tends to be stabilized through homomultimeric contacts. So the multiple proteins tend to uh, interact with low affinity contacts that stabilizes the helix and forms this kind of a mesh that keeps these liquids together. Um, and what his, the lab has also done, uh, Nick Fossey's lab, is to identify point mutations that will change the behavior of this uh, helix on a kind of a gradient. You can have a very strong breaker mutation changing alanine to proline. So alanine promotes helix, proline is the amino acid that breaks the helix the most. Or you can have mutation that actually adds another alanine a little bit further down of the helix and creates a longer helix, which will make it even more stable. Um, so those were all biophysical studies, but when we made these mutants and put them into the cells, we can actually see this fossa in the cells perfectly following the pattern predicted from biophysics. So you can see this wild type uh, behavior here in terms of the FRAP behavior and dynamics, and the mutants perfectly follow the predicted gradient from one that has less dynamics to one that has more dynamics here. Um, and also I should point out that these three mutations are also reflected in ALS. So these two are ALS mutation. This one is here very similar. It's the same um, position, but in ALS is mutated to a V rather than a P. So in some way we can learn about ALS looking at these two. And because we are mainly focusing on this clip cross-linking approaches, we wanted to understand something about how the sequence of the RNA, the kind of specific interactions in vivo are now affected by this changes in condensation of the protein. So first of all, does it affect just the ability of the protein to bind RNA? Does it affect regulation and recognition of specific RNAs? And if so, which RNA binding features can explain that change? So what can we learn about the role of the RNA in this process? Um, so this is the clip now, just to take you a little bit through the method. As you can see, it's made of several steps. Um, this is a recent review that we wrote about it, so you can look at all the intricate details. There are many variants of CLIP available now, and uh, the original CLIP that I worked on for my PhD at the time, there was no high throughput sequencing available, so we were just doing mini preps and sequencing of every single clone. Nowadays, we can get millions and millions of reads from a single replicate experiment, which makes things much easier, of course, but also bioinformatically more challenging. And I would just say it's made out of three steps. First, you need to cross-link your cells or tissue under conditions that keep the cells as intact as possible. Then you can lyse them, fragment the RNA to just remain enough RNA that you can then map it to the genome. Um, you purify those fragments of RNA together with the cross-linked protein. We can visualize them on the gel, uh, do lots of quality control and then prepare cDNA library for sequencing. And we have lots of tricks in the system that we can really quantify individual cross-link events and map individual cross-link events. So you get a landscape of cross-linking across the transcriptome through this. Um, and you can read more about both the experimental and computational angles of it in my website. We have a form where you can post questions, comments and so forth. Um, so here were the results we've got when we compared the clip patterns across these mutants. And these mutants are here ordered in the way that um, the foci have been forming in the cells. So from the ones that have the greater perturbation of foci to the one that has even more foci than the wild type protein and the wild type is at the end. And here we're just showing the enrichment of different sequences in the data sets. And you can see that there are certain groups of sequences that had a greater enrichment in the wild type protein and other groups that had a greater enrichment in those mutants that don't form the foci very well and that are very dynamic. So we group them mainly in three different groups based on this behavior. And the main takeaway point here is that they all have this UG dinucleotide, which is the core sequence specificity of TDP43. But those that have really repetitive patterns of UG tend to be more bound by the wild type. And those that have some interruptions of the A will be more bound by the mutants. 
And you can see that the more of these interruptions of the A we have, the more defined is the crosslink around the motifs. So the ones that are bound more by the mutants have the types of crosslinking where the protein binds sharply on the motif and not much around it. Whereas with these repetitive motifs, it tends to bind to the motif, but also you can see the motifs being spread around these crosslinks. And that's largely because these motifs are much more repetitive and they form much longer clusters around on the binding sides. So it actually, you can see that when we visualize it this way, that here the deletion has less binding to this motif than the wild type, but on the other hand, more to this other motif. But it made us think that it's not just the sequence of the motif, but probably the way that these motifs are arranged on the RNA. So that's, that took us into another way of visualizing the data, where we're now looking not only the sequence, so the sequences are now grouped into these three different classes of sequences. We're also looking at the density of the motifs. So the, the color coding here is by how dense are those motifs in the binding sites, but also how long are the binding sites. So the longest binding sites are the ones here that are having stretches of motifs that go over 100 nucleotides on the RNA. And the shortest ones will have less than 30 nucleotides from the relatively sharply aligned binding sites. I don't have time to define all the bioinformatics behind here, how we define the binding sites, but just a simple takeaway point. We've done multiple experiments and maybe we can just highlight this first experiment where we compare the different mutants, where you can see that there's a kind of a gradient of change. Um, gray means more binding. So you can see that these binding sites that are tend to be long and tend to be composed of these canonical motifs are bound more by the wild type and we can visualize these sites like something like this. So we have really dense sets of motifs that can stretch over 100 nucleotides or long. And we are thinking here of the RNA binding protein assembling into some kind of a condensate on those sites. We call them binding site condensates. They are not the types of condensates necessarily as these huge things that happen in vitro, but sites that do require these interactions through these disordered regions to allow protein to really be condensed on those regions of the RNA. And then on the other hand, we will have these relatively short binding sites that may also be very dense, but on a much long, shorter stretch. And here we don't require this condensation so much, just the proteins on its own, because the sites are quite clustered and definite defined, uh, the protein can assemble just through these structured domains quite well. Each structured domain on its own only recognizes up to six nucleotides. Actually, the two, the each protein on its own, the two domains, the two RMs tend to together recognize six nucleotides. So that's not very much. You really need to have lots of protein copies assembled together to be able to assemble over a long binding site. So now we have some insight into the RNA features that are connected to these condensation properties of the protein. But we want to also understand if that has something to do with the way these RNAs are regulated. Is this just you know, uh, some phenomenon of, that we can see by clip or is it relevant for the way this biology works? Um, and how is this binding positioned? And the first, the most important regulation for disease is actually the protein regulating itself. So one thing to just clarify the confusion, the protein name is TDP43, but the gene name for this protein is called TARDBP. It's just a little confusion in the nomenclature. So it's the same thing really here. Uh, we're talking about the mRNA encoding TDP43, and this is called TARDBP. Um, and here we're looking at the clip data of the protein binding to its, to its own RNA. This is a 3 ER of this protein. This 3 ER can form two different variants here, two different 3 ERs, and it's known that the protein regulates this formation of alternative 3 ERs. Um, and it tends to bind into this region here that has clusters of motifs. And you can see if we just look at the clip data and the kind of distribution of binding across this region that you see the same pattern as we saw in kind of across the transcriptome that there is a gradient of change with the mutants that are more prone to condensation having more binding than the ones that don't. Again, protein needs to condense to be able to bind efficiently to its own RNA. And um, we can see that reflected in regulation. So when the protein binds to its own RNA, you can see 
the result here. So this is the endogenous protein in HAC293 cells. And here we're inducing the protein from a flipping cassette, which can be induced with doxycycline. And we're looking at the effects on the endogenous protein within one, two, or three days. And you can see that within one day of induction of this gfp tech protein, the endogenous protein virtually disappears. So very quickly, presence of added copies of the protein leads to disappearance of the endogenous because these extra copies will bind to the tripromethyl of the endogenous protein and inhibit production of that protein. This is this auto negative feedback loop. But the mutant copies are not capable of doing that very well. And the less they're cap capable of condensing, the less capable they are. You can see that this capacity of regulation forms a gradient that perfectly phenocopies what we've seen when we looked at the droplets in the vitro uh, and when we formed the protein in vitro. So basically we see that what we see here in terms of the clip binding is reflected by the capacity of regulating. Um, and I mentioned that it regulates itself by regulating alternative triprim and uh, processing alternative polyvinylation. And this is a process where the RNA is cleaved and the poly A tail is added on the RNA. Coordinated by machinery that is very close to RNA polymerase is this tripram and processing machinery. These are the factors involved. But what you can see here is that usually around these sites of processing, we have lots of GU rich sites, which are bound by the components of this machinery. And the TDP43, I, we believe, is a competitor. When it binds to the same sequences, it can displace these other molecules in most cases. In some cases, it also recruits them depending on where it binds. Um, but generally, that's why we think it's quite a common regulator of this process. And we analyzed this regulation across the transcriptome to find that the wild type protein regulates quite a large number of these alternative poly A sites across many different transcripts. And here in red, we are color coding the extent of regulation. So let's say it's saying 0.6, it means that 60% of the variant has changed. That's a huge change, almost complete swap in the way that these three prime isoforms are used. Um, and then we are checking how well can the mutants do the job compared to the wild type. So again, this mutant that is, that is good in condensation can do the job almost as well as the wild type. Whereas the other mutants lose some of the capacity. But interestingly, there's a subset of sites where the mutants lose the capacity especially the ones that are completely incapable of condensation, and another subset where they're still doing the job perfectly well. So we divided these two subsets into what we call um, C CR dependent, so they're dependent on this conserved region, or independent, or dependent on condensation. And here are some examples. So the ones that are dependent on condensation here, you can also see the way that the clip pattern looks on them. So you can see that there is a loss or decrease in binding. The ones where we see uh, regulation preserved, we also see binding preserved very well across them. And what you can already see by eye on those examples is the one that the regulation is lost tend to have these humongous stretches of repeats across hundreds of nucleotides often. Um, whereas the ones where the regulation is preserved tend to have more of this red class of motif. As I showed earlier, this motif is less dependent on condensation. And these motifs are a little bit less dense, a bit more kind of sparse and defined. Um, and we can see that also globally if we quantify that comparing these two sides, the ones that are dependent generally have loss of binding um, and have um, slightly different motif composition. And we can see this loss of binding being reflective of the extent of mutation, how strong the mutation is. Um, so really to take a very simple conclusion, we basically think that this condensation of the RNA binding protein can happen on specific binding sites. We call them binding site condensates. And those binding sites often are important for regulation. <clears throat> Whereas other binding sites that are more local and more composed of these red motifs don't require condensation. <clears throat> and also protein can still regulate at those sites independent of that condensation. And one way to step away a little bit from this um, is looking at a movie that I love uh, called The Run from Akira Kurosawa, where this is actually a movie made uh, on the theme of King Lear's, 
King Lear, Shakespeare's King Lear, um, but in a Japanese context. So Hidetora is actually playing King Lear, and instead of three sisters, he's having three sons here. And he's just telling them, one arrow alone is easy to snap, but if you put three together, it's much harder to snap them as a bunch. And that's very much what I believe is the reason why the protein often binds to these stretches of motifs, lots and lots of motifs together, because it can achieve the type of stability there through condensation that it can displace other proteins and can achieve its effect in a way that perhaps is more potent and perhaps particularly important in certain biology. But we don't know yet what kind of biology is so important. Now, um, we've been talking about splicing at the moment, mainly in triplement processing, which is phenomenon going on in the nucleus. But actually, most of those condensates that have been studied in the context of RNA biology are actually in the cells visible in the cytoplasm, such as stress granules. When cells are under stress, they form very large granules of RNA binding proteins. Granules that transport RNA to those distal sites where synaptic plasticity is happening or axon guidance. And those neuronal granules are also form very visible condensates and all kinds of other types of granules. And I think these insights we're having here, are just like the first little bit of top of the iceberg. There's so much more going on where the RNA sequence motifs and these arrangements of motifs, which we call multivalent motifs, are probably driving more stable assemblies that are important, but also the stability is not fibrillar, it's dynamic. It's in this kind of liquid droplet state where the proteins have a lot of change of constantly responding, rearranging themselves. And it's a different way of thinking about biology, I think because of this fluidity of the process. Now, um, when we go back to the ALS, these normal physiologic condensates are fluid. They are in this kind of generally liquid form. Nucleoli, for example, that make ribosomes are also a liquid based condensate. And those are the ones I would call good RMPs, dynamic changing and so forth. Whereas in a disease state, they tend to transition into these fibrillar aggregates. So when initially I showed you the TDP43 in these droplets, but if you leave it long enough in solution, or if you have these disease causing mutations, it will start converting into this fibrillar state that looks like this, where it's very long fibrils, very stable. And there you don't see the FRAP dynamics anymore. The protein just stuck there. And that, I like this kind of analog here with these evil minions because they look so similar to this fibrillar aggregate. So somehow we're trying to figure out how to make the evil minions less evil. And maybe that will tell us something about how to approach ALS and this type of diseases. Um, now, let me see, I'm not following the time. I could end here. Um, I don't see the time on my laptop. Can you remind me what the time is? You are doing fine. So you, you still have 10 minutes. Okay, so is it um, 50 past 10 now, right? Yeah, it's 50 past 10. Yeah, I guess we should also have enough time for questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, and usually you have questions and then finish at 11, right? Yeah, so I wouldn't want to go. What I'll do now is just two minutes to conclude and give you a little bit of just snippet of what I wanted to tell. So I wanted to put it a little bit into evolutionary context, but of course, I'm never very good with timing. And um, the analog I wanted to say here is that the RNA binding proteins are more like this. So they are this kind of, you know, constantly frustrated human being who doesn't really change very much in evolution and relatively fixed. What changes is the tools that they are working with. And indeed, in the case of RNA binding proteins, most of their variation is actually happening on the RNA. So in their binding sites. And that's where this, what I was just telling you, comes to evolution. And we've been working on that a lot because we realized a lot of this regulatory evolution in RNA networks is happening via transposable elements. And here is a nice study with the role of transposable elements in transcription with the line elements. And these are all the various people working on this topic in the past. Most of that is published, so that's why also I can just speed through. Um, the fact, you know, our genome, half of it is made of transposable elements. And some studies are even indicating perhaps three quarters. If we wanted to be extreme, we could almost say all of it. 
because it just depends on how long transposable elements have been in there for them to evolve so much that we can't recognize them anymore as being transposable elements. Basically, transposable element is a selfish copying element that copies itself. If you think about it, life is nothing else but a transposable element. We're just from the beginning, something has started copying itself and from there on evolution continued. So in, in our modern cells, we have very complex genomes. There are certain sequences that are very, very simple that are still behaving like perhaps the life was when it started, when it was very simple and copying itself. Nowadays, they appear very different, but still you can recognize them. And you know, half of our genome is very recognizable as being this self-copying system. And generally it was meant to be something that you know, is not very good for us and is somehow just selfish and tolerated. Um, but the more and more we're recognizing that actually it's um, something that's very important for the way our cells work too. Um, so the, the ones I would just quickly mention are the lines and the alus, which are the largest proportion of our genome. Just the two of them alone would account for about two thirds of the genome. And alus are the most numerous in terms of the numbers. Um, I think we have over 2 million perhaps in our genome. And they are primate specific, which is interesting. They emerged very recently. So they might, they're likely contributors to some recent evolution. Lines are mammal specific generally. So they really contribute to some mammalian innovations. Um, and uh, what is also important is that most of those elements don't copy themselves anymore. So part lines, we have, I think, also close to 2 million, only 50 of those are still capable of copying themselves. All of the rest are dead. Also alus, they don't have elements, they don't encode anything. They depend on lines for copying themselves. So generally these elements are hanging out, even though they're actually not copying themselves anymore and they're hanging out in our genome in large numbers, which makes you think there must be something going on. And so one story that we found here was that these elements are actually bound to RNA binding proteins such as HRMPC, and they can be present in genes in both orientation, not just in that kind of normal sense orientation, but also in an antisense sequence to the kind of standard element. And they can still bind to certain sequences. And the default sequence binds very well to HRMPC, but then we see that through evolution, they accumulate mutations that can allow um, splicing factors to come in and they often then create new exons and new elements or regulatory elements. And we, talk, we saw that in case of lines is even more interesting because lines are very big generally and they bind a greater variety of proteins. We focused on two proteins here, PTB and Matrin. And the other thing that is interesting to think about is that these elements tend to emerge at the origin of an evolutionary kind of branch. So alus are primate specific, lines are mammal specific. Actually, if you talk to an evolutionary biologist, you realize that every branch of kind of life, including plants or so forth, will have its own transposable element that emerged at the origin of that branch. And it's hard still to prove it, but it's very likely that transposable element was the kind of way that that branch could evolve into a larger branch and gave it a whole new perspective of genetic variation. Uh, and what is interesting is the proteins that bind to these elements have been there much longer. So alus bind generally to these proteins here that we have studied and others. Lines bind generally to these proteins that have been around much longer. So the cells kind of have an environment that can nurture these elements that is preceding them. And the elements can exist and spread because those partners are already there. And these partners are essential for them to spread and not essential in a way that they would promote their replication, but essential in a way that they make them um, a little bit more integrated into the cellular networks. So for example, if we look at the line elements, they are just covered by motifs that bind these elements here they have hundreds of repeats. So they are heavily, heavily multivalent. And we have shown that these proteins also form these phase separated um, condensates on these elements. Actually, in this case, the two proteins together needs to promote their condensation on these elements. 
And then by tracing the evolution of these elements, you can actually see how ancient they are. And you can say, okay, some are very young, they've emerged only recently in primates, some are more ancient across mammals. And the more ancient ones tend to be more prone to binding enhancing proteins, the ones that promote processing, where the younger ones will bind to this type of proteins that tend to repress processing or kind of keep them a little bit less potent and more neutral. And we can see this, you can see a whole groups of proteins that differ between these classes of proteins. And also the way they're positioned around exons, the young ones are further away, they're deep in introns, they're kind of hidden away. The ancient ones are closer to exons and often they even make exons. So the alternative axons are more often made from the old elements. And the more lowly they are included, the more likely they are made from these elements. So this is kind of the process of evolution happening. These are the elements that are emerging. They're not yet fixed. But basically the summary is, we're having these huge condensates of proteins happening on transposable elements from proteins that have preceded these elements of evolution. So elements are kind of integrated into the cellular pre-existing networks. And to start off when they merge, they are kind of cloaked by these elements in a way that they, they are hidden and they don't cause any damage. And then through evolution, we can actually see when we look at contribution to, their, to the RNA in our tissues, that actually gradually they start to shorten, they start to bind to more productive proteins that actually start to contribute to tissue specific, cell specific, um, elements and axons. And um, now just to conclude very, very broadly again, in this movie, there's this um, scene at the end, which is very kind of symbolic, where um, this person who cares, is the only person who still cares about this King Lear role, says the failed mind sees the heart's failing. And in a way, then it ends up by this, you know, tragic figure somehow finding some resolution by being cloaked with flowers. And I think we're trying to find here now in science some type of a way to find a way out from this crossroads between evolution and disease, because evolution needs these types of heavily multivalent sequences made of often transposable elements and self-copying elements that keep on emerging because it creates a new potential in the cells. It's something that just doesn't necessarily yet give very definitive functions, but might give very cell-specific variants, something that is emerging and gives, you know, we have thousands of these elements. Actually, we saw with the lines close to, um, between alus and lines, we have close to a million of those elements that are assembling proteins within deep intronic regions, especially in neurons, which have huge introns. Um, but most of them are very, very early stage of functionality. And proteins need to have this capacity of condensation on them. It's part of a way that these kind of forces of repression and function can shape themselves in a very balanced way. But also those condensation processes over time are prone to aggregate. That's just their biophysical capacity. And now that we're getting older and older, that process immense, it starts to create problems for human society. We, we have more and more of this neurodegenerative diseases being a problem. And yeah, I think that it's not a simple problem. It's not as simple as cancer, where you can just find a simple drug and kill the cancer cells. Here you have to find a balance. And so I think we have to think more deeply about ourselves to figure out how to solve this issue. And that's why I think this talk was a way to maybe step away. So yeah, just to sum up, these are the people I already mentioned earlier from my lab. It's a very collaborative work with Nick Lascom's lab, several bioinformaticians involved, and Jim Shorter on the face operation in this work. We are funded by ERC, European Research Council, Wellcome Trust, those are our main funders, also the Motor Neuron Association. And the work is done mainly in the Francis Crick Institute, but I'm also a member of Queen Square Institute of Neurology. Um, as far as this work is done, I recently have a satellite lab that I started, but that's not yet relevant for this work. 
and you can contact me for any questions. So sorry that I went a bit too long and happy to take your questions. Wonderful talk, wonderful Janesh. Uh, so beautiful insights into lines and signs. Uh, so questions. <clears throat> Sometimes I feel that if I go a little bit too far away and you know, quickly, <laughs> it's hard to ask questions because. <laughs> no, you were right in time. You were right in time. We usually give 50 minutes to 60 minutes to the speaker and then we start questions. Mm -hmm. So you can unmute your mics and the ones who have questions. Okay, Yarne, thank you so much. Really, I think this talk was more also to the philosophy of the, you know, all these things. Uh, I was wondering in this uh, first part of your talk, these uh, aggregates uh, with the TDP, what is the fate of those mRNAs which are bound? Are they get, you know, totally repressed translationally? That's why they become toxic or what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, the first one I showed was the RNA encoding TDP43. So it's autoregulation. And I showed that when protein binds to it, then no protein is being made out of it. It represses its own translate, it's kind of making new protein. Now, I think it acts at multiple levels of RNA regulation. So it can regulate alternative polyadenylation with multiple different UTR variants, but can also travel with this RNA into the cytoplasm, especially in neurons. And there it can contribute to translation and repression, as you said. It can also travel with this RNA to neuronal processes. And it has been shown that TDP43 is essential for appropriate localization of certain RNAs. And through that also this kind of trafficking along the long dendrites and exons that are very thin can be perturbed when these aggregates happen in the disease because these aggregates are too big and they don't have the kind of dynamics that is needed during the trafficking. Because when you think about trafficking and neuronal dendrites, you have things coming both directions. Um, and you have vesicles going in, you have all, you know, ribosomes need to travel, they're big things. So normally the way this trafficking works is that often during the trafficking, things have to disassemble and reassemble in order to allow these different types of thing, kind of organelles and complexes to pass each other in these very thin dendrites and axons. So if you don't have the dynamics, if the aggregates become solid, they can't disassemble and they might just be stuck there and block everything else. That's also one, one thing people are studying in terms of what is the real kind of problem eventually when, when the aggregation starts. I, I wonder whether I'm frozen or... No, oh, everything is okay. So, Jan, uh, this uh, condensates of TDP43 uh, and condensates of other proteins as well. M many proteins are being, uh, you know, discovered that they, they, they make these condensates. And it reminds me of the prions as well. So, mm -hmm. do you think actually this is an intrinsic property in certain proteins uh, that they, just like prions, they may exist in two uh, conformations or two states. Mm -hmm. let's, let's call it like this. They have two states and you know, one is more like functional state and the other, which we consider non-functional, whose function is yet to be discovered, uh, mm -hmm. is a way of regulating uh, cellular functions. So this condensation in TDP43, do you think it is RNA dependent or even in the absence of RNA, TDP43 is anyway going to make condensates? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So I think there's two questions here. First of all, what is the relationship to prion-like phenomena? Yeah. And then what is the role of the RNA? So, um, and first of all, I can't give the ultimate answer for either. Um, but it is true that this region, these disordered regions, have been also called prion-like sequences. I've shown that there are certain regions of that portion in the TDP43 that have lots of um, 
glutamines, I believe, and sequences are kind of similar to prions. Yeah. And in a way, there's bioinformatic approaches that have shown that RNA binding proteins, especially, have most sequences related to what is the kind of regional yeast prion. And I think that it's still unclear how much of those state transitions are heritable across cells, for example, or even across organisms, because that's with prions and you can eat it and it will travel to your brain and transition the system or so forth in the medical disease or so forth. That's still a bit of a question whether that's a phenomenon that can happen with proteins like TDP43. But it is true that if you take this human inclusions from a human brain tissue and incubate them with uh, cell culture or brain slices or so forth, they will cause the endogenous TDP43 to very quickly start aggregating in the same way. So they are somehow, you know, cells can take them up under this type of culture situations and they can propagate themselves in some way. So it's possible that once the process starts in the brain that you can have, especially when cells are dying, other cells taking them up, you could have some propagation going on through that similar process. But I think it, in case of TDP43, I think this is still up in the air in terms of whether this propagation is the way the disease actually spreads in the brain or not. For tau, for example, it's been shown a bit more. Um, now, in terms of the role of the RNA, um, I've used this term binding site condensate because I believe when it comes to the RNA, these are condensates happening on a very micro level that might be sub microscopic. They do involve this structural transition. You have to have the condensation that forms this alpha helix that promotes the condensation. Um, but this is just a few hundred nucleotides of the RNA and we might be talking about a few dozen copies of the protein. Um, so it's on a very small level. It happens across, we've seen it tens of thousands of sites on RNAs endogenous, so many different sites. It's hard to imagine whether that's the same as these big foci that we're seeing in the nucleus by eye. And those foci, I would say, are more similar to what we see when we just have purified protein in vitro with no RNA. That purified protein is perfectly capable of making this large phase separated droplets. So Definitely, you're right. The protein on its own is able to condense. Uh, condense. And um, actually, people have shown that for proteins like TDP43, if you remove its RNA binding domain, it will condense in the cells more and also be more prone to aggregation and perhaps be even more toxic. So, so far, most studies are indicating that the RNA is actually a force that counteracts that extreme type of condensation, where it forms huge aggregates. Um, but what we are now showing is that even on the RNA, condensation is still important for binding and regulation, but on a very molecular level, um, and perhaps not in a way that it would really involve this large phase separation, like huge biophysical phenomena. It involves the same interactions and does involve some crowding, um, but at a different scale. Um, now, in terms of how these changes are actually contributing to some kind of transitions in the physiology, I think they are. And for other proteins, let's say CPB, uh, there are people, I think Kaushik C have shown beautifully that in terms of memory, there's potential that um, you could encode some aspects of memory by a structural transition like that in, in a protein that, like CPB, which is an RNA binding protein present at the synapse that in response to certain cues can change its, its kind of structural conformation in a long-term way. And that could change its functionality and encode some information. But for how many proteins this applies is still a big, big question. I think there's a lot to be discovered still. And second question was regarding this uh, ALU uh, and signs and lines, because that's a new perspective I, I learned, I must admit it. Because my understanding was, you know, these sequences are uh, mostly dormant. They are silent, uh, kept under tight control. Mm -hmm. uh, did I understood, uh, understand correctly that we do have their RNA sequences uh, which are being bound or bound by some 
RNPs and they are playing a, a regulatory role within the cell. Was it correct? Yeah, it, I'm glad you asked me because I went very quickly through this. And so I think it can be easily misunderstood. In some way, I would agree with you, they are dormant generally. Yeah. And they are kept dormant through being integrated in this regulatory network, being bound by so many proteins that keep them at the appropriate level. And most of them are deep into introns in, in positions where they don't very much contribute to any functionalities in the cells. So in some way, you could still consider them dormant, even though they are being transcribed. So um, it's true that initially, most of those elements have been studied in the context of transcriptional control. And definitely, they're kept when they are in the intergenic regions on its own. It's, there are plenty of transcriptional modes to keep them quiet or to control them. Um, we have the pi RNA pathways, for example, um, and uh, that's certainly important. But what we now show is that in the post-transcriptional level, we have just as much complexity or more. And um, actually, when we look at the distribution of those elements across the genome, there isn't general trend to have more outside of genes. And there are certain elements that are more common inside the genes, actually. So for example, the, the sense, uh, it depends on the orientation. So the alliance and alus would be more likely to be in the antisense orientation inside the genes, for example. So antisense sequence relative to the sequence of the gene. So they're still transcribed, but they're transcribed in the opposite orientation to what they would be when they would be transcribed on their own, as, as if they had their own kind of um, integration or so forth. And in that opposite orientation, they tend to be particularly potent as kind of evolutionary driving force for RNA elements. And they also have lots of sequence elements to recruit other binding proteins. So generally, yes, you know, a lot and lot of them are transcribed because actually when it comes to protein coding genes, they they have very long introns often, especially neuronal genes. So lots of elements are within those long introns, but the lots of intergenic space is transcribed too for all kinds of reasons. And they can also have some roles in those transcripts. Other questions? Abdullah? Yes, so I have a question. So um, you you mentioned that uh, the mutant proteins are not able to bind to the RNA binding. The mutant RNA is not able to bind to the proteins, which uh, the RNA binding proteins. So if they are not being bound by the RNA binding proteins, how come they um, cause the disease? Is it just by forming the aggregates? Like, I mean... Uh, only the fibrillar structures, or they are interfering with some other cellular function as well? Mm -hmm. So I've shown that a subset of the binding sites of a protein don't bind as well to it when it's mutant. And um, the mutations that are involved in ALS were somehow in the middle of this gradient of effects. They were not the strongest. And they're quite subtle mutations. And the other thing you have to consider is in ALS, uh, it's actually uh, this heterozygote scenario. So um, only one of the alleles is generally mutated. So you still have a wild type copy and one of the alleles has this kind of mutation that might perturb RNA binding to some extent. So while in our case, we're you know, having a situation where we are removing the endogenous protein, replacing it with various mutants to see how well they can do the regulation. In ALS, we still have one copy of the endogenous. So I, I wouldn't immediately be able to say whether our phenomena in terms of changes of binding and regulation are the driving force of ALS, because there we still have a wild type copy. Um, They're mainly telling us that something is changing in the way that the protein assembling is assembling on the RNA. And if you ask me, the most important relevance for disease is the fact that RNA has been shown as a force that counteracts the aggregation of the protein. It creates these condensates on the RNA that are on a molecular scale. 
whereas protein on its own will form huge condensates. It tends to be very sticky and it goes kind of, kind of this irreversible um, phase separation that eventually starts to aggregate and become really self-sustaining and irreversible that induces the disease. So I think the condensates on the RNA are very, very dynamic and very diverse. And we have thousands and thousands of them happening on a very small scale. And the, this copy of the protein has a mutation that is a little bit less capable of making this RNA-based condensates, still has the capacity of making its own condensates of, of the protein on its own, actually has even usually a greater capacity to form fibrillar type of aggregates. So I think it's mainly this balance between molecular scale condensation that is healthy and important for the cells and this more self-driven condensation of one single unit that propagates itself uh, in isolation that is disrupted in disease. And so, yeah, then the protein, when it doesn't have RNA as much, is not capable of using RNAs. RNA is a bit of a buffer for the process. That is the way I would kind of say how our findings are relevant for the disease. So, yeah, I'm not sure if the loss of function, this kind of idea that the protein can't regulate the RNA as much is really the primary thing, though we do see that the protein, especially the capacity of autoregulate itself is the most sensitive to the mutations. And that's also very relevant because when the protein can't regulate its own levels, then the abundance of the protein increases. And that also will drive the aggregation of the protein. This protein is very sensitive. Its levels have to be just right um, because it has to be chaperoned by a bunch of other types of proteins and so forth. So when its abundance rises, the cells, especially in kind of in the aging context, are less capable of keeping it under proper control. Uh, yes, because it seems if it's uh, not able to autoregulate itself, um, uh, this indicates that this is somehow interfering with some other cellular function as well, because cell somehow senses the mechanism or the protein which is being abundantly produced. So if it's being abundantly produced and not being bound by any other RNA binding protein or a chaperon, which is uh, which may be regulating the cellular um, uh, stoichiometry of the protein or RNA. Mm -hmm. So this uh, indicates to a situation where it is uh, showing that it may somehow be interfering with some other function of the cell as well. I agree. I agree. Thank you. Thank you for the answering. Thanks. Uh, Abdullah, there are other questions? So I have just one question from my side. So I was just wondering that if the nuclear localization sequence has been unchanged in the when we see the change of localization in the disease states. So did you, I was just wondering if you see some changes in that or ha, is that conserved? That's very good intuition you have. Not in TDP43. So the mutations in TDP43 are generally in this region that we've been studying and the NLS is on the N-terminus. There are some more rare mutations on the N-terminus that could directly influence NLS, but in other proteins, such as FAS, for example, FAS is the other pro the kind of the second most studied protein, perhaps in ALS in terms of RNA biology, and there the most common almost mutations will change it and its NLS, uh, often truncations of the proteins, where the protein then fully goes into the cytosol and those are also the most aggressive mutations. The, those patients often have the disease already at 30, 40 years old, whereas otherwise it normally happens around 60 or so. So you definitely totally on the mark. Those kind of mutations are, when they happen, are very, very problematic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jarnaj, uh, one last question from my side. So it TDP43, binds its own RNA as well. So there is this feedback loop. Uh, then I see condensate as well, a regulatory. I, I, I consider somehow in my mind that that's also a way of regulation. Uh, yeah. In that condensate, it must be binding some other RNAs which, with, with which normally it, it, it binds. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to bring in the picture that 
uh, neat variants of micro rna as you showed in the beginning you know the 20 kb which yeah. somehow squesters and then the short one where yeah. so did it show some sort, sort of condensates with long non coding rna not with long non coding rna and mm -hmm. can you so yeah we did see also this same mutations that affect condensation change binding also to the neat RNA. So that was one of the big changes too, which I didn't show here. Um, and a bunch of other non-coding RNAs that are also capable of making these large, large condensates. Um, so yeah, I think there's auto feedback through auto regulation, also through the assembly of on neat RNA. How this works together is still unknown. The other thing we have to be aware of is that this region that we've studied is very, very heavily covered with post-translational modifications. People are, you know, from phosphorylation, acetylation, even oxidation of methionines has been shown important. Um, and this has also in some cases been shown to change the properties of the protein in terms of its capacity of condensing and capacity of regulating RNA. So you could then imagine how easily signaling pathways could shift the capacity of the protein to auto-regulate itself, change the abundance, change its assembly into paraspeckles, and you know you will have cells are way beyond us. I think yeah. you know they yeah. build all these networks to kind of allow them to first of all buffer themselves to med to be resistant to a variety of perturbations, but also allow to shift between various states. It's it's good you brought in the cell signaling because. Uh, next thing I was going to ask you that this phase separation, uh, you know, let's say this condensate and then non-condensate state, is it somehow, is it known whether it sells some signaling pathways playing a role there mm -hmm. to, to bring a protein into condensate form or non-condensate forms? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. People are, there's plenty coming out. I think what we're waiting for now is for some modeling of all these different layers of data to you know to really combine fields that don't necessarily you know you don't have any single lab who would be able to study signaling and RNA biology and phase separation and everything yeah. you need to have some really good people with modeling skills who can now take all these layers of data and try to make a model of how this actually works together in a cell and how it allows cells to respond to things so you know, your talk has, um, you know, brought me uh, 14 years back when I was a postdoc. Um, mm -hmm. And I was working on polycom proteins. Uh -huh. And we were trying to find prion like domains in polycom proteins. Mm -hmm. And our hypothesis was that, you know, due to this, there will be conformational switch. Uh, in one conformation, it will be performing function. In, a, in another, it will try to sequester <clears throat> proteins away. Uh, so we found this glutamine arginine rich protein uh, pro, uh, domains mm -hmm. in polycom proteins. Uh, we did show that GAGA factor, it's a transcription factor, and that, you know, by doing all these experiments in the yeast, we showed its prion like domain indeed behaves as prion like domain in the standard yeast assays. Um, however, since this uh, speckles you showed, there were many proteins and I cloned polyhomeotic, zest. Uh, when we used to express them in cells, they were very big speckles and we could not make sense of those uh, speckles. Mm -hmm. And listening to your talk today, I'm thinking maybe we should think of you know, some condensates of polycom complexes. I know there is a paper uh, coming up, or maybe already there, uh, who briefly touched upon this. But th these condensates, which initially I thought is is you know, because there's a everybody tries to find, then they go in the same bandwagon. Mm -hmm. But uh, since I have seen these big speckles in cells of polycom proteins, mm -hmm. uh, three different proteins, I think this phenomenon is much more prevalent within the cells. Mm -hmm. uh, for regulation of different processes. Uh, yeah. Jury will be out, which processes will be there? Yeah, often people these days start in a similar ways we've done, just mutating these regions in various ways. 
seeing how that affects the speckles or whatever kind of foci you see in the cells. Once you've done that kind of sense of relations, kind of a gradient of effects, then you see how that gradient reflects itself on the functionality of the protein. And because with polycomb, the functionality is not that hard to read out, yeah. it would be probably a very nice thing to do. Yeah. 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 Not so, wouldn't be surprised, as you said, that some, some of that is already undergoing. Yeah. So yeah. If you can contribute, would be great. I think there are no more questions. Uh, let's thank. Uh, Abzal has a question. Abzal wants to say something. G. Abzal. I think that his mic. Abzal, is... your mic is mute. Sorry, I... so the, the mutants uh, which are found in ALS. I was wondering, are there studies about the stability of the proteins which are, you know, mutated or in your lab you have these mutants? Did you also study the half-lives of these proteins, whether they are same or different? We haven't, but it partly has been done by others. So with the ALS mutants, it has been shown that um, on the protein level, they can change the half-lives. They can change the stability of the protein to some extent. I think in this case of the mutants, we didn't see, uh, because we did a rapid induction and then monitored at the expression level, we didn't see the mutations changing the abundance of the proteins very much. So I think for our findings, that probably wouldn't be too much of an issue because also it's done in hex cells. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's very like, it depends also on the cell type you're looking at and so forth. It's something one needs to consider for sure. All right, thank you so much, Jan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Anaj. Thank you, it was a real pleasure to have you and to listen to such an exciting talk. I, I hope we'll bug you more than often. <laughs> yeah, it was good that we got in touch and Julian connected us. So thank you so much, have a good year. And Same to you, we wish you a wonderful year, a safe, healthy year. Uh, and a lot of fun with the newborn and the two-year-old as well. Thanks so much. Have a good day there. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.